I'm going to go ahead and record it, but Scott, you can take it over from here, introduce yourself and jumping into the topic for the day. Great. Thank you, Emilio. I really appreciate it. So it was an honor to be uh, asked by NOVA to come on in and tell you a little bit about the VA Health Professional Scholarship Program. I'm Scott Dixon. I am a program specialist for the VA's, not only the VA's Health Professional Scholarship Program, but the Visual Impairment and Orientation and Mobility Professional Scholarship Program. So that's why we call that BIMOPS, because nobody wants to say that to Times either. Uh, and also, we run a, a couple of different scholarship programs out of our office. Uh, our program director is pa Dr. Patrick Youngblood, who oversights this program nationally. And also on our team, we have uh, Rodney Back, who is the placement, residency, and clinical coordinator for our program. And he will be joining the call a little bit later as he is stuck in a call right now. So hopefully, he'll be able to get off and Come on in in case you have any questions about that piece of our program, we can talk to you about it as well. In 2018, the uh, President of the United States, uh, along with Congress, voted in the Mission Act of 2018, aptly named. And in that authorization, it allowed us to expand the Health Professional Scholarship Program out only out till 2032, which is now our current sunset date. But it also authorized us and mandated the VA to select 50 position scholarships a year uh, for uh, DOs and MDs. So last year, we did our first selection of these professions, and we selected uh, 64 positions for scholarships, and we had about 110 applicants for those 64. Very high selection rate for this scholarship when you consider that most of these four-year scholarships are between $150,000 and $200,000 over the four-year lifespan. And that is to continue all the way till our sunset date of 2032. So we are taking the opportunity to let schools know about the scholarship opportunity, give you some background information on it, how it works, what the expectation is, what you can expect if you're gonna apply, if you accept the scholarship it's selected, and then what to expect when you graduate. So I'm gonna just jump in and let you know that I put in an info link link under the chat window that will help guide you through some of the more detailed information about the Health Professional Scholarship Program. It'll give you some insight about the different programs that we cover. I've already mentioned the physician ones, but we also do physician assistant program for veterans this year. Uh, we're also doing uh, medical technologists, nurse practitioners in mental health, a diagnostic radiological technician scholarship, uh, a standard BSN nursing, and we're actually getting into an LPN version of this uh, starting this year specifically for isolated locations in Texas. Uh, but you can see our program is definitely growing. In 2016, when we started, we selected 30 people for scholarships. Uh, last year, we selected 156 people for scholarships, and the trend is continuing to go up as the VA continues to push money our way to help solidify the foundation of caregivers uh, to our veterans at the bedside in hospitals all across the United States. So it's an exciting time to be a part of this program, I can tell you that, seeing how I was here from the start of it and helped write the legislation to, and being able to see this come to full fruition is just an amazing opportunity, an amazing job to be in. So let me tell you a little bit about the Health Professional Scholarship Program. Like I already mentioned, the occupations we're targeting, and those are identified clearly in the hyperlink that I sent you. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you're at in your education. For physicians, we'd like to pick you up before yes. you can get into the physician program, right at the, before you even start. We want you to be able to take full advantage of the scholarship and be able to get the most amount of money without ever having to use FAFSA or any other uh, support to pay for your tuition. The other programs though, physicians assistants, DRTs, and all these other programs are directly it's a year for year exchange with two years and we do target those that require the least amount of education, but that doesn't work the same for physicians. It's also important to know about the physician scholarship side of this, that there's no veteran requirement. You don't have to be a veteran. Your mom and dad don't have to be a veteran or anything like that. It's open to all US citizens. Uh, and that US citizenship needs to be by naturalization of birth. Uh, the uh, scholarship does not allow us to take people that are on green cards. 
And so that's part of the eligibility. To be eligible to apply, the first thing you need to have is an unconditional acceptance into a, a college or university for the degree program that we're seeking. And so if you're going to be a DO or an MD, you need to have that unconditional acceptance prior. If you're having to do some prerequisites and your acceptance into that position school requires you to complete a couple of courses, then those courses have to be completed, the grades have to be posted, and the school has to submit unconditional acceptance before you'll be eligible. Now, you can apply while you still have those conditions, but you can't be selected until those unconditional or those conditional requirements are cleared, cleared up, and you have to submit a letter showing that as well. The, so that's the initial eligibility piece of that. And there's some other smaller eligibility and then if this is something that you want to consider to apply for, then it'll walk you through what we're looking for. It'll tell you what makes you ineligible. There's some other things about uh, if you were involved with uh, illegal activities or something, things like that, or drug charges, losing your license for malpractice, all these kind of things that kind of play into that as well. But those are all clearly outlined in the application process and it's not, it, it won't be vague for you. So, and you also must complete a background investigation. The background investigation will not be conducted unless you're selected. And then it's called a tentative selection until you pass that background investigation and then you'll be offered a final award if selected. So that's the basic eligibility. The, what's great about VA HPSP is number one, the not all, we also, pay, you know, we pay for the tuition 100% while you're in school, but we also pay for mandatory fees with the exception of health insurance, dental insurance, or any kind of life insurance like that. We won't cover that. And we won't cover like travel expenses if you're wanting to do a Australian uh, clinical or something like that, some special unique thing like that. We won't cover travel associated with that. We'll still cover the tuition for the actual class, but we're not gonna pay for the travel expenses for that. There's a, uh, and we also provide a monthly stipend while you're in the program. The monthly stipend is currently $1,142 a month while you're in school. So say for instance, you go to school January through May, you decide to June and July, I'm not gonna take any classes. During those months, you do not receive the stipend. So as long as you're in school, at least one day you receive the full amount, but if you don't go to school at least one day, then you're not. And clinicals count towards being in school. So if you're in a clinical or if you're in a research project or something like that, that counts towards being in school. And so you'll receive the stipends during those months. We also provide an annual book stipends for physicians. It's $1,500 a year. It's paid at the start of the year. So if you're selected for a scholarship that starts in July, you'll be paid $1,500 and that'll go, that'll be the amount for the full year. I've also been authorized to allow for uh, paying additional amounts above the 1500, as long as the student's able to provide those book stipend receipts in excess of 1500. So you have to show the receipts up to 1500 and then the amounts over 1500. We understand that some schools could be as much as 2500, 3500 for the first year and second year. Uh, so that's what we cover. Now, I'm trying to make sure I covered all the things we have. Oh, VA HPSP is a non-taxable scholarship program. So if you're selected for the scholarships, you're not going to receive a form from us showing this benefit that you receive because it's a non-taxable uh, scholarship. And so that's the benefits of being in the HPSP. The process is simple. You apply. Once you're ready to apply, you do some uh, a, a preliminary application. It asks you a whole bunch of questions. You answer some essay questions, provide awards, professional activities. You provide academic, uh, not academic. I can't think of the other thing off the top of my head right now, uh, but you fill out a whole bunch of questions on the initial application. Uh, once that initial application is done and you submit that, the system generates a brand new email to you and says, hey, um, thank you, but now here's some more stuff you got to do. And so they send you uh, a link to go in and go and provide two recommendations at a minimum, unless you're a VA employee or previous VA employee, and then you have to provide that third one. Uh, you also have to do an academic verification, provide a resume or CV, and transcripts supporting a cumulative GPA that the system asked for. And all of this is built into the system. 
once you're ready to apply. So I'm not telling you anything that you can't figure out on your own, but that's just the process. And then once your application is submitted, I review it. I make sure that you're eligible. I make sure that you provided all the information. I do not evaluate your essay questions. I don't go and say, hey, you didn't fill this out or you didn't fill that out. Um, that's your responsibility, but I make sure that you're eligible. Uh, once I make sure you're eligible, I forward that to selection committee. Selection committees, your application is scored by three individuals. They score your cumulative GPA. They score your recommendations. They score awards, professional activities, organizational memberships, veteran status, the school you're going to, how much it's going to cost to support you through the entire education program. I said veteran status. And then they make a decision based off of that information. That information is, uh, and once that's done, your score is done. The selection committee doesn't make the decision. They just score for you. Then your score is taken and compared against your peers, your graduation group, the time period, and then we maximize the VA funding to the best of our ability to make sure we can maximize the providers that we can provide the VA in the coming years. So all of that's taken into consideration. If you're selected, you receive a notification that you have to do a background investigation. You have to fill out some additional documents. And I wanna tell you about one of the most important pieces of document right now, because we're at that point. And that's called the mobility agreement. The, for VA HPSP, you have to be mobile. Basically saying that after graduation, you have to be willing to work in a facility that might not be in the state, that might not be in the region that you're wanting to work in. So please, that is one of the biggest considerations we tell individuals before they apply for the scholarship. If you are not mobile, this is not the scholarship program for you. You have to be mobile. I know that for physicians, if you're going into general practice, you're going to be able to pretty much go anywhere you want to go because there's plenty of openings. But for those individuals that want to specialize in a fellowship after residency, you're going to have you're going to be limited on the places you can go and you need to have the flexibility to go to where there's an opening and a need, the highest need in the VA. So just keep that in mind as we're discussing this and I'm hoping Rod is going to be on the call shortly. This is his area of expertise. I know a little bit about it. Okay, so for the uh, residencies uh, for the doctors there are placed with the uh, AMA. Uh, we don't have our own special placement for residencies. And it looks like Rod is on. And you'll just place with your peers uh, for the physician program. And which is really good uh, because, you know, the VA is not telling you, you can't do this and you can't do that. We're only telling you that you can't be pediatric uh, because obviously there's no need or placement for a pediatric uh, doctor in the VA. We are going to work with you. We want to work with you the best we can for residency. We're going to support you through your residency. And when I say support, I mean, uh, we're going to wait for you. We're going to defer you through your residencies. And that deferment does not increase your service obligation, like with the other programs that we have, like the PAs, the DRTs, the pharmacists, who all have, if they want to do a residency, it increases their amount of service obligation. Uh, but then if you want to do a fellowship again, we're going to support you through that fellowship and we want you to specialize and we want you to do what you want to do. But like I said, just be advised that uh, specializing uh, limits uh, placement availability. And I'm going to let Rod talk more about that uh, here in a few minutes. Uh, so I always like to reemphasize that mobility agreement because some individuals get into it, they get all the way through the selection process and then they realize, hey, wait, I might have to move. Well, yes. And it's we're not keeping it a secret, it's out there. There's a high likelihood that you're gonna to have to meet the needs of the VA at a location other than where you're currently at, even where you might complete a residency or a fellowship. So the placement process, how that works is, once you are um, within six months of completing your residency, uh, Rod Back, who I'm gonna let talk for a few minutes here, will tell you a little bit about how that process works after residency how you would potentially be placed at a location. And I'm gonna go ahead and let Rod jump in real quick and discuss that. Rod, you there? I'm here, Scott, can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead, Rod. Okay, so so as far as the placement process, I, I'm assuming these are all physicians, is that correct? Or uh, medical students? If these are all uh, students that are currently in uh, pre-med, I believe. Okay. 
So um, as far as like the, uh, uh, the med school, you know, Scott's already discussed that. As far as the placement goes, um, what we're going to do is, is allow you to go into whatever residency you want to go into. Um, if you're going into primary care, um, just know that that's going to open up a lot more uh, opportunities for you to go to different locations um, and then become as you become more specialized then that kind of that kind of wills you down as far as uh, you know where you can go because uh, it, it has to be um, at a location where um, we have that particular specialty or that particular need and so and I'm, and I'm not going to say that that's a hundred percent uh, factual all the time because, for example, let's say that you're a uh, uh, you're a dermatologist and uh, a particular facility doesn't have a dermatology and but they would love to have one. Uh, that doesn't mean that they that you know given enough time saying hey we got an individual who's interested in coming to your particular facility they may very go out may may very well go out and create um, a position for a dermatologist in order to be able to have you come to their particular facility. So that's why we start working with you, um, you know, six, seven, eight months prior to you completing your residency. So we can get some ideas of where you want to go and start, start getting you involved in, in the communication process with some of these folks um, who might be interested in having you come to their particular facility or any, any particular facilities that you might be interested in going to. So, um, uh, let's see. Anything else you want me to touch on, Scott? Nope. And I uh, appreciate you being here. And uh, and if you don't mind just sticking around, I will I will uh, call on you when needed. But I did get one question in the chat window. So the mental health. If you're a, a, a nursing MP and you're looking at mental health, uh, we're definitely looking at those. The other psychological master's program, psychology, sorry, psychology master's program, that's not specifically identified. There's some, uh, we, there is a need for psychologists in the VA, but we haven't been able to figure out how to best manage that if we select those. So um, that's a good question. So primarily nursing, yes, BSN all the way. We'll take thousands and thousands of BSN applicants. That's no, that's no issue. Uh, when it comes to the graduate level nursing program, if you're in a psych mental health MP program, uh, you have a higher likelihood of being select, selected. And, uh, but we are looking at other uh, MP programs as well for selection this year. You can still apply even if you're an M1 student, even all the way up to the, if you're a third year, you can still apply for the med school scholarship. Uh, it's not NP, it's NP like nurse practitioner, Christina. Hey, Scott. Uh, yes. Um, I'd like to add on um, regarding the nursing part of it. Uh, under HPSB, um, we're, we're kind of excited about this, that in the last, uh, just the last couple of weeks, we have uh, formed an agreement with the VA's Office of Academic Affiliation. And, uh, and, and the academic affiliation for the VA on the nursing side of the house, um, they govern all of the residency programs. And so what's happening um, now is that um, every single nurse that uh, comes on board through the Health Professional Scholarship Program is automatically going to complete a residency when they, after they graduate. So regardless of whether you're a BSN or regardless of whether you're a nurse practitioner, um, once you complete your uh, education, your main degree, then you're going to go on uh, to a residency program to enhance your skills as, as a provider for the VA. And, uh, and so that, uh, that is extremely important, especially today um, with, with COVID. Um, a lot of the uh, institutions out there, uh, their students aren't, getting the clinical rotations and stuff like that, that they uh, were hoping that they would get uh, because they just, because of COVID itself. And, uh, and because of that, uh, these, ro these uh, residency programs are, are really critical. And so that's why um, uh, we're excited about this. And uh, so those individuals may not only get one year of additional experience, but they get the additional training skills and enhanced skills that you can only get from a, from a, 
a competitive residency program. And HPSP uh, recipients, uh, they pretty much have the golden ticket and get an automatic ride right into a residency program. And there is a question about the, uh, do you have to move right after graduation? So it depends on uh, your program that you're in. If you're in one of the med programs, we won't require movement until residency is completed or fellowship. But the other piece where you might have to move is for the other individuals who might be applying for nursing or PA or DRT or MT or something like that, then you would potentially have to move uh, within 90 days of graduation or certification, whichever is the latest. So that's Rob's goal is he's wanting to get you at your location within 90 days of certification and graduation. So, and Dr. Youngblood's been IMing me on the side saying, uh, sorry, you couldn't make the call. Uh, you guys have fun and let me know if you need anything. <laughs> Okay, and so it provided the information on the website. So that website's a drop-in site. It's an informational site, but at the very top of it, if you decide this is something you want to apply to, please just, uh, there's an apply here button at the very top of that site, and you, that's where you start. And I apologize ahead of time that ID me process is a pain and uh, we realize it, but it's something that we just have to go through to get a uh, third party somebody validating a third party login so it's safe or whatever. So just bear with that part of it. And once you get through that, it'll be a lot better. The PA, the website says being a veteran status is a requirement. And so that's a good point, Ivana, for PAs this year. Uh, we're only authorized to give PA scholarships to veteran students. Uh, that's a regulation that authorized it. We weren't gonna select any PAs this year uh, because the numbers have gone way down uh, but legislation requires us to do a pilot program for PA veterans. And that's the only reason we're selecting any PAs this year at all. And feel free to jump off mute real quick. And if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. We're, I pretty much covered everything about this program. And I know I went into a whole bunch. And MD and DO is open to everybody. Yet. It doesn't matter. The only one that has the veteran requirement is the PA program. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, is this program also for pre-dental students? Uh, not for pre-dental. Uh, dental is one of the programs we could grow into in future years, but not this year. Uh, we just did not have the capability to do that this year. Okay. I have a quick question. Go ahead, Grace. Um, so on the website, I'm reading, it says physician, and then it says 18 month service obligation for each year of support. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Yes. So physician is the only one that doesn't have the year for year and the minimum of two year service obligation. Physicians and a DO, they're all 18 months with no minimum. So it's for every year of support, it's 18 months of service obligation. That service obligation, so if you come in as an M1, and you're wanting three years of support, you're going to give the VA 4.5 years, so four and a half years back. And then uh, after that service, obligation, well, that's not really important to this meeting, but uh, so physician's the only one that has the 18 month per year of support. Okay, and does that include residency and fellowship as well? No, the residency does not, does not count at all. So if you jump in and you're selected for the scholarship and you require four years of support, the maximum service obligation is going to be six years. And so the residency does not count. It doesn't add to the service obligation for MDs and DOs. Uh, for anybody else who requires it, like pharmacists who like to go to um, P1 and P2 after pharmacy school, uh, those are a year each. So for each year that you go to one of those type of residences, it adds six months to your service obligation. So it's a 50% add on to your service obligation. So one year residency at six months of service obligation, except for MDs and DOs. Okay, great, thank you. No problem. And for this obligation, does undergrad, um, is it factored into that obligation or is it just for medical school? The service obligation is computed as part of your contract. So there won't be any surprises. You'll know exactly how long your service obligation is going to be. And if this is for a BSN, 
for an MP scholarship, uh, you'll know that you're going to have the additional service obligation based on the uh, requirement to attend the residency. Okay, thank you. Well, Emilio, I think I've answered some questions here, uh, but I'm going to put my contact information in the chat window uh, for the VA, and I'm also going to put Rodney Back's chat uh, contact information, and that way you guys can reach out to us if additional questions arise after this meeting. Absolutely. And Scott, I'll also follow up and send you information. We do have a pre-health virtual career fair and a nursing uh, career fair. It would be free of cost. This might be another avenue to uh, promote uh, this amazing opportunity because as you were talking about, I, I started seeing a lot of other avenues uh, to kind of get the information out to students. That's great. And we look forward to participating in those uh, whenever we're going to be available as well. Yep. I'll send you the information if not for the next one. But Scott, thanks so much for taking the time today um, and, you know, being able to speak to our students. Um, I'm going to end the recording now so that we could be able to send it out. But thank you again for sharing your insight and everything with our students today. My pleasure. Thank you again, Emilio. I'm still putting the contact information in, and once I get that done, I'll jump off here. Perfect.